All right. Um, thank you, every. No. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us um, for this final presentation before we um, move into conference closing mode. Uh, Lily Ryan, our speaker, is an historian, systems engineer, and privacy activist. She consults on identity and access management systems, security architecture, and software delivery, gives public lectures on ethics and the security mindset, and provides what she describes as paranoia as a service. <laughs> She's also always happy to talk about greyhounds. Um, but first up, Lily's going to talk to us about Wildman White House and the great failure of 1858. Hi everyone, um, how well can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Lots of thumbs up, cool. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. They're the traditional custodians of this land and I would like to pay my respect to their elders, both past and present. So, thank you for coming to my talk. I can promise you lots of drama and backstabbing and poetry and lessons. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to talk about my slide background, which is, I know it's a little hard to see, but I want to do anyway. Um, can, can everyone up the back see it's kind of swirly? Yeah, a bit of nodding, all right. It'll look better in post. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this, this is a reproduction of some authentic Victorian era wallpaper that would probably have been in a rich person's house around the time that my story takes place. And what I really like about this pattern is that if you entered a house that had it, your chances of dying would increase exponentially. Um, and this is because this pattern and a lot of others like it were covered in arsenic. <laughs> arsenic would give you really vibrant colors. So a lot of rich people who could afford vibrant colors plastered their homes in it. And I've color altered this one for safety reasons. <laughs> So this sample is from a book called The Shadows of the, from the Walls of Death, which is pretty cool. It was published in 1874, and there are only four copies of this book left because most of them were destroyed in the interest of public health. <laughs> and I really hope the people who digitized this copy are okay. <laughs> anyway, this doesn't really have anything much to do with the story that we're going to hear today, but if you're wondering about a lot of the behavior that went on during this period, just remember that a lot of people were literally inhaling poison with their breakfast. Okay, moving on. My name's Lily Ryan, and my career so far has existed at various points on the spectrum between historian and hacker. And I really like to talk about all the weird things that went down in the past so that we can learn something from them. And I think that being able to reflect on the failures and mistakes that we've made in the past helps us to build better teams in the future and to do better work. And the story that I'm going to tell you today is one of the biggest failures in tech history. I think that successful reflection comes in two halves. Firstly, we want to understand how we got to where we are and secondly, we want to apply those lessons to where we are going next. The problem is when a team only does the first half of this, which is what can often happen. You think about what you did, don't take any lessons from it, and then do it again. And you can often get away with this for quite a long time if things are actually going all right. If, but when things go wrong, Applying these lessons to future actions is what makes it really important, and it's definitely the only thing that can pull you out of a bad cycle, unless you're very, very lucky. And it's usually when we fail that our projects are thrust into the spotlight, just at that moment where we re really want to hide. But let's talk about success for a bit. One of my favorite things about the successful release of a product is the Go Live celebrations. It doesn't matter if this comes in the form of an office party or if the team slink off to a bar after work or if they even get to have one at all because they're not just sitting there and hoping and praying that the build doesn't fail. Probably one of the biggest go-live parties on record happened in 1858 after the completion of the first transatlantic telegraph cable. And I wanted to pause for a little bit to talk about what a telegraph is because it is so old that it is not vulnerable to meltdown or spectre. <laughs> so most people here have probably never used one. So that's a picture of a telegraph receiver. Basically, 
Telegraphs were the first internet. In the Victorian era, people started to send messages to each other along copper wire using basic electrical pulses. And mostly they'd use Morse code, long and short pulses indicating in different combinations, different letters. So you'd write your message down on paper, you'd take it to the telegraph office. They would dip that in in Morse code for you to the direction you wanted it to go. Somebody would listen to it at the other end, dots and dashes, write it all down on paper again, put that in an envelope and send it to your actual recipient. That's how that worked. It was better than normal mail because electricity can travel much faster than trains or horses, which is good. So telegraph messages got to their recipients a lot faster. And by 1858, both North America and Britain had extensive internal telegraph networks. This was how most people did business. But to send a message from Britain to North America or vice versa during this time would take several weeks because you had to write it down and physically put it on a ship and wait for that ship to sail across the sea. And that was why when people heard that they were thinking about building a telegraph cable that went across the ocean, connecting the two continents, pretty much everyone went absolutely wild for it. So the 1858 telegraph cables completion heralded one of the most spectacular go-live parties in history. On both sides of the Atlantic, people fired cannon, and they let off fireworks, and they danced in the streets, and they wrote reams and reams of some of the worst poetry I have ever heard. <laughs> Here is some. <laughs> Tis done, the angry sea consent. The nations stand no more apart. With clasped hands, the continents feel the throbbing of each other's hearts. <laughs> speed, speed the cable. Let it run, a loving girdle round the earth, till all the nations neath the sun shall be as brothers of one half. Thank you. I did not write that myself. <laughs> and there was heaps more where that came from. People really, really loved this cable, like a lot. They loved it so much that they were still celebrating a week later. But the weeks of party hit a snag when the cool new telegraph cable went completely dead. So these days, when a big release goes bad, we usually have some strategies in place to work around this. We don't always assume that things are going to work first time. We hope they will, but we plan for the worst. We might have thought of a way to roll the changes back, or we plan a soft launch just to make sure that things are really working. But the telegraph guys hadn't thought of anything except success. There was no fallback plan, so when this failed, there was just a lot of rage. And we all like to think that the software that we build, the stuff we build is going to change the world. And quite often, it does. We change people's lives all the time by rolling out new products to make sure that the people who use and trust us with our business can do what they need to do. So if this is they need to make an insurance claim faster when it really matters, or they want to split bill payments at a restaurant, or get live updates when there's bad weather coming. All those kinds of things actually do make a difference. But the transatlantic telegraph cable changed the world in a really huge and history-making way, like the invention of the car, like the internet. It was that kind of scale. This kind of makes all the fireworks understandable from the Victorian perspective. I mean, I don't find the poetry understandable, but we can put that part aside. <laughs> I also hope, though, that it will help you understand just how dramatic things got when this amazing cable just totally died. And when your entire you know, user base is the complete population of North America and Europe, and the first person who wants to use it is Queen Victoria, <laughs> you really feel the heat when things go wrong. It's always a hard time when a project fails. And a lot of us have experienced this at one time or another. And if you haven't, you almost certainly will. No, you will. <laughs> no matter how excellent your team is or how good your idea is, not everything's going to go smoothly. But failures are also really valuable. And for me, they've been the places where I've learned the most about myself. I've learned where my strengths are as a team player, my technical strengths, the ability of me and my team to bounce back when things go wrong, ways that I can improve. I think that reflecting on your work is often richer after a failure. Asking yourself and your team, what did we learn, gives us really useful fuel for moving on. Unfortunately for the transatlantic telegraph cable team, 
1858 was only 15 years after the first computer program was written. And it was 45 years before the first computer was built. <laughs> and it was a time when the phrase agile retrospective would only ever be used to describe someone looking over their shoulder rather than running away from the bad guys. <laughs> so they really didn't have any models to learn from. But this doesn't mean that we still can't learn something from the project today. Because in many ways, this is the cornerstone of every modern delivery project. And the key person we're going to learn all this from is this guy. This is Dr. Edmund Orange Wildman Whitehouse. Sideburns. Sideburns. <laughs> yeah. So this guy, in addition to having like, the best name and the wildest facial hair on his entire team, he was the chief electrician of this project, which meant that he was basically the tech lead. He was also the main architect of its demise. White House had a history as a doctor and a scientist and an inventor. And when I say inventor, when I was doing the research for this, I found a patent that he'd lodged for a new kind of roller skate. <laughs> and he had also dabbled in telegraphy as one of his many, many side projects. And he'd patented a number of deviations on telegraph technology, which was basically just like, forking other people's repos and changing a line and committing that and saying that the whole thing was your work. Anyway, all of this, his GitHub profile, everything, this had impressed this guy whose name was Cyrus Field. He was an American businessman who was providing all the money for this telegraph cable thing. So despite having no experience with actually implementing any kind of telegraph system, he got appointed as chief electrician to the Atlantic Telegraph Company. And the main problem with the transatlantic telegraph cable was that nobody was really sure if it could actually be done. We'd had telegraphs for a while, but not, never anything that went underwater for such a long way. This is a cable that had to be over 3,000 kilometers long. It's a long cable. This kind of felt about as impossible as building a space elevator to the moon. And at the time, scientists were still discovering some of the really basic laws of physics that we take for granted today. So it wasn't just, we know this is technically achievable. We didn't even really know how electricity worked at all. Electric currents were being used for a lot of stuff in 1858, but it still wasn't really well understood. And this meant that a lot of the ideas that people had about how to run a current along a cable that was 3,000 kilometers long under the sea were literally just guesses. And the only way to prove or disprove that guess was to build the thing, which was going to be extremely expensive. Fortunately, Cyrus Field was very rich, and he had absolutely no idea how impossible it was, this was all supposed to be. So he went ahead and kind of Elon Muskishly just hired a bunch of people and got it done. One of the other people that Field hired was this guy. This was a young man, his name was William Thompson. He had fewer cool names and fewer credentials than White House, but he was also a keen physicist. He had a lot of interesting ideas and theories about how electrical currents worked. And Field had discovered Thompson after a few papers and proposals that he'd written for how to build this telegraph cable. And he liked his spirit, so he hired him. And when White House met Thompson, it was rivalry at first sight. They hated each other. White House was used to being listened to, and Thompson was younger than him and questioning his authority, and his, he had no measure of respect with the board. His facial hair wasn't nearly as majestic. <laughs> I mean, look, later in life, he would grow a beard that was so magnificent that it would make a hipster weep to see it. But at the time, anyway. <sighs> the main point of contention at this point was about how the cables themselves should be designed so that they could hold up to the distance that they had to cover and still carry a signal. White House argued that the copper that was used to conduct the signal should have a small diameter, uh, but the voltage that was used to push the signal along or carry that signal across the ocean should be really strong, kind of like yelling the current between the distance <laughs> of the two continents. And he also decided that the cable needed to be really heavy so that it would sink to the ocean floor. Thompson disagreed with him about pretty much every aspect of the cable's design, but White House was confident that he was right and he had a better beard and he refused to hear any of Thompson's ideas. And there also wasn't much time to persuade anybody that Thompson's ideas had merit because Field and the board wanted this project 
to be delivered yesterday. He'd gone and gotten the investors all excited, so they wanted to see it. England and America were really excited and wanted to see it. There were a lot of people waiting, so they had to get it done. They rushed out the cable. They used White House's design. They stuck the two halves of it on two different ships, and one of these ships was going to spool the cable out behind it from Newfoundland, and the other ship was going to do the same from Western Ireland. And the idea was they'd meet in the middle and join up the cable, and hey, there's a working telegraph line. This picture shows how they loaded the cable onto the ships. They basically made a little bridge to roll them along because the cables weighed about an imperial ton per mile. So they couldn't just be carried, really heavy. And unfortunately, White House's health wasn't great at the time that this project was going on. So that meant that it was up to Thompson to actually get on the ship that was going to carry White House's cable out across the sea and spool it out across the Atlantic. So the younger man had to actually oversee the project while White House remained on shore and waited and probably schemed and did this a lot. I don't know. <laughs> the first attempt out at sea was a total disaster. After about three days, this incredibly expensive high-tech cable snapped under its own weight and sank to the bottom of the ocean and was lost. <laughs> Whoops. So Field went and made his excuses to all the investors and he got some more money to make a replacement cable. And this is what they're doing in this picture. They're covering the cable with layers of gutta percha, which is a tree, tree sap. It comes from a tree. It was molded soft and then it, it hardened like plastic over time. And this was before plastic had been invented. So the Victorians used it for everything to the point where the tree itself nearly went extinct. But then plastic was invented. So trees were saved, but then plastic. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, after about a year of all this very expensive cable making, the new cable was ready and they loaded it onto the ships and they set out to sea again. The idea the second time around was that the two ships would start in the middle of the Atlantic and then go towards the coast from there. And it took them three more tries, meeting in the middle and sailing out again, and every single time the cable snapped. It's costing a lot of money and taking a lot of time. And in one of their attempts, the cable was almost completely destroyed by a passing whale, which you can see illustrated here. I like to call this the original fail whale. <laughs> But by the fourth attempt, they had made it the whole way across the ocean without the cable breaking at all. And it was connected to the local telegraph network at both ends. And it was declared ready for business. And this was the point where the entire Western world went completely wild. And they kicked off that go live party that we talked about earlier. And there was all the poetry. That was then. This was, at, this was also where Wildman Whitehouse sealed his own fate. He and Thompson had argued over how the cable should be designed, and now they fought over how it should be operated. As I said earlier, White House had designed the system to generate a very strong electrical current along the entire length of the line. And Thompson had managed to get him to put some brakes on the voltage, but, and the system wasn't generating nearly as much power as it was able to do. But as the weeks went on, the demand for telegraph use grew and grew. Messages backed up at both ends of the line. So White House secretly increased the voltage as high as he could make it. In prod. <laughs> his, his, his expectation was that the stronger the current, the faster and clearer the messages would get to the other line. Yeah. The reality was that this amount of voltage completely fried the extremely expensive cables, and he had actually overwhelmed them with power, which meant they shorted out into the sea. And some of the nearby sharks probably had boiled fish for dinner. <laughs> so the upshot of White House's secret tinkering with the system meant that this famous cable was completely dead within about three weeks of going live, and the world was very angry. And so was Cyrus Field, and so was the entire board of the Atlantic Telegraph Company, because they had literally one job, it was in their name, and they hadn't managed to do it. This is pretty much as big a disaster as if the entire internet had gone down and they didn't know if they were going to get it back. So when a project fails, this spectacularly, and when this much money is involved, there's usually a lot of public head scratching and soul searching about what went wrong and where it went wrong. And questions get asked. And as you probably expect, the best companies 
will usually take some time to step back and reflect on what's happened to try and see what lessons they can learn to make it better. And while most of the board of the Atlantic Telegraph Company were busy doing this, the one man who wasn't was Edmund Orange Wildman Whitehouse. He had skipped right across this reflection stage and straight into the deep pit of blame, which is unfortunately very easy to fall into. He didn't want to reflect because he knew whose fault it was. Literally everyone else's. <laughs> Except him. The public was so angry with the failure of this cable that it demanded and it got a public inquiry into the whole affair. And it was one of the first project retrospectives ever to take place and it took place in front of an entire country. During this inquiry, William Thompson testified to all of this advice that had been ignored by the chief electrician and others stepped in to testify to the fact that they had seen the chief electrician messing with the voltage levels on the cable in the weeks after its completion, which was completely against what the board had decided to do and against all known scientific advice. So getting feedback like that, it's a little bit of a blow, especially when you thought you were doing a good job. And getting feedback like that publicly is even harder. And it's natural to feel defensive when this happens. And honestly, public feedback about a specific individual is generally not a great idea. But that's what happened. And it's usually not a great idea because it often leads to situations like what happened after this. So White House hadn't entered into this inquiry with an open mind. But honestly, he hadn't entered into the entire project with an open mind. He was a self-righteous Victorian-era gentleman scientist and a doctor and a member of the Royal Society, and he was used to being treated as though this meant he could do whatever he wanted. Unfortunately for White House, there was no software development community in 1858 to suggest to him how he might tactfully handle this kind of situation. <laughs> so he did what an angry, self-righteous Victorian-era gentleman scientist would do. He wrote a pamphlet. <laughs> and he sent it to all the papers, and he had it published in them. This pamphlet was called The Atlantic Telegraph. But a better title might have been, Everyone is wrong except me, the best scientist in the world. <laughs> I could describe it, but I'm going to let White House speak for himself here because it's better. <clears throat> The charges leveled against my ignorant unsuspicion are three. Three of the most derogatory and detrimental, not merely to the fame of a public, but to the character of a private man. In the one case, however, error is but human. In the other, disgrace. From the first, my advice and wishes as projector had been disregarded and overruled. And as an officer, I had constantly been thwarted and obstructed in my operations. I do not shrink, therefore, from the avowal that, accustomed to such treatment and aware of the incompetence and division of counsel existing in the board, I determined to do my best on my own responsibility to save the enterprise from destruction. I make no appeal ad misericordium. I seek for no sympathy on scientific grounds, sufficient for me that I have been identified and from the first with that prodigy of this age, which may become a new starting point in history till the end of time. <laughs> a great responsibility rests upon those who have in any way contributed to the failure of this enterprise, but for my own part, I can safely say that neither zeal, labor, caution, nor anxiety was wanting upon the part of Edmund Orange Wildman Whitehouse. <laughs> Royal Institution, Albemarle Street, and move them. <laughs> It may surprise you to learn that publishing this defensive pamphlet did not really convince anyone <laughs> that the failure of the telegraph cable was not his fault. At any rate, it convinced a lot of people that regardless of whether or not it was his fault, they didn't want to work with that guy. <laughs> and after this, he was uh, unasked to be chief electrician of the Atlantic Telegraph Company, which was fine by him because he didn't want to work with them anyway. <laughs> mm. And he folded his arms and he stormed off to his room or something. Unfortunately, I've seen many projects even in this day and age and this way, and I'm sure a lot of you have too. And this is a real shame because in 1858, it was already obvious that this was a really bad way to run a team. 
there are a few things that I want to highlight out of this whole telegraph cable affair that I think that they're in real, really, really important. Firstly, open-mindedness among your team is crucial to success, but it is also crucial to good failure. Constructive reflection cannot happen if there are members of your team who aren't open to being challenged or having their minds changed, even by people who are considered due to them. Secondly, if the project gets to the point that things are really bad, feedback should be given sensitively, with tact, and most importantly, privately. People are naturally going to get defensive if they think that they're being attacked, and especially if they think that they are having their value challenged in public. It's not a good time. Thirdly, in order to be effective, retrospective should always follow the prime directive, which is here. Regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. Having a framework like this creates a safe space for reflection where people can openly discuss failures without fear of blame or without fear of being blamed. It's also a good reminder for everybody there that blame is not appropriate. So you can, even, like, you can even print it out and put it on the wall before you do one of these. I found that really helpful. Finally, there's no room for hero behavior on a strong team. I think that the story of the first transatlantic telegraph cable would probably have been very different if that team did not include Wildman Whitehouse. <laughs> While there were definitely problems with the way that the inquiry after the failure of the cable was held, was handled, they, they may not have even needed an inquiry if he hadn't been involved in the first place and they'd appointed someone else. One of the strongest findings of this inquiry was that White House's behavior was a real problem. Most particularly, his inability to listen to anybody else and his tendency to run off on his own and make crucial changes to the project without telling anyone else. Because we've never met anybody like that in a development team. <laughs> Occasionally, you will get people on teams who want to be seen as heroes, because our culture often romanticizes this idea of someone who swoops in and saves the world all by themselves. And this is really cool if you're Batman. But if you've ever watched a Batman movie, you, you See how many innocent people get their cars smashed with big chunks of concrete and have their legs broken when he's chasing after a bad guy. They're just standing there. And the same thing happens with heroes on projects. They might get some personal glory, but team members who ended up with bits of smashed building crushing their parked cars aren't going to remember that person fondly and probably won't want to work with them again. So this makes for a terrible team environment. And we all know that unhappy teams don't do good work. Here is a, re a quick recap of all of that, in case you missed it. Open-mindedness, feedback sensitive, remember the prime directive, and there's no room for heroes. So, with the moral of this story over, you may be wondering what happened to the Telegraph Cable Project after the dramatic pamphlet incident. <laughs> You'll be pleased to learn <clears throat> that the Atlantic Telegraph Company learned something about teamwork from their first iteration. They appointed William Thompson as the chief electrician next. This was great because in addition to having far more solid and reasonable ideas about physics than his predecessor, he was also delightful to work with and he knew how to treat his team with respect. And at this point, the Western world's demand for a transatlantic telegraph cable was so large and the Atlantic Telegraph and the Atlantic Telegraph Company had had so much experience in like laying the cable at this point <laughs> <laughs> that they didn't actually have that much trouble getting money to, to, try, to try again. And this time, they built the cables the exact opposite of White Houses. They were large in diameter, not quite so heavy, so that they could be a little flexible in the sea currents and they hopefully wouldn't cause themselves to snap. And they used a comparatively tiny amount of voltage to power them. And when they went out to sea the first time, the cable snapped again. <laughs> but because they'd been through this so many times by now, Thompson and his crew knew enough that they could actually go and retrieve it from the ocean floor and repair it. And they went back for a second cable. And by the time that second cable had reached both, coast, both coasts, they had hooked up the repaired one, too. So now there were two working telegraph lines across the Atlantic, and they both worked. <laughs> 
and after they had tested it to make sure that it really worked, <laughs> the whole Western world had another wild go live party. And eventually, they laid undersea telephone lines, and even more eventually, there were undersea fiber optic cables, and we all lived happily after in an interconnected world. The end. <laughs> Um, quickly, as an aside, in a shameless self-promotion, if you're interested in getting a scarf or a travel mug with this arsenic wallpaper pattern on it, <laughs> this is a link to that pattern on my Redbubble shop. Um, if you're interested, you don't have to. Go back to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hi. Where are the bananas? Sorry? Where are the bananas? Where are the bananas? I ate them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was August I did that. You think they would have lasted that long? No, you could have redone them. I could have. I didn't bring my makey makey. Sorry. For those who don't know, last time I gave this talk, I wired two bananas up to my computer and used them as my slide clickers instead of this thing. Um, as you do. As you do. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Yes? Uh, did the comparatively boring rollout produce any poetry? <laughs> I think so, but not as much as the first time. I think that one of those things they did upon reflection was not write that again. <laughs> <laughs> There's still bad poetry out there, but um, you can look that up on your own time. <laughs> I think it was not that boring. I mean, they dropped the cable again. They had to go back the next year again. <laughs> Yeah, lots of like round repeating verses. You could sing it over the top of one another. And, yeah. Um, yes? What year was it complete? Um, oh, good question. 1865 Okay. What year was it complete? Someone's Googled that. 1865 and 1866 were the two. 1865 and 1866 were the two. Yep. Okay, but this was 1858. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it was actually, do you mean like complete the first time or the second no, time? The, the, the actual second one. The actual second one? That yeah. Right. Okay. Like sure. All right. Um, anyone else? Mm, yes. Do you know the story about one of the first telegraphs being sent um, to instruct the Americans to, to arrest someone who was fleeing England as true? Do I know if one of the first telegraphs that was ever sent was to sent to instruct the Americans to arrest someone who was fleeing England? Is that true? Good question. I don't know. But I have a whole other thing about the first time they ever caught a criminal who was trying to escape another city on telegraph inside England. And that was really cool because when they arrested the guy at the other end and he'd left Scotland or something, he'd murdered someone. Back in the day, you used to be able to just change your clothes and get on a train and then get off in London and no one would know who you were and they'd never find you. Um, but anyway, they realized, the cops in Scotland realized that they could actually send a message that was faster than the train. So they messaged the police in London and said, hey, there's this guy, he's done this thing, kind of looks like this, probably changed into these clothes, he's on this train. And the cops waiting for him at the other end and he's just like completely unfair to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Did not factor that into his murder plan at all. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that was the first time that happened. Um, yes. So just to clarify, with the arsenic paintings, so at the time, yes. I gather they, they, since they burned all the books, they assumed it was the pattern that was causing the deaths, not the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the actual arsenic in the pattern. You know, they, they didn't, uh, yeah, since you said they destroyed all the copies of the book. The copies yeah, but the books, the books had actual samples in them. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the books were actually samples. And there are pictures of them digitizing this one, where they're all like gloves, and not just the normal archivist gloves, but it's like hazmat suit and gloves and <laughs> the whole thing. Like, I don't know how they did this and got such clean images, because I would have been shaking. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, anyway, they're really cool. If you want to, you know, buy one. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Oh, you actually do? 
<laughs> right? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, sure. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah. Were those the very first two cross oceanic cables? Um, they were the first two that worked. <clears throat> that worked. Yeah. Do you happen to know how many we have now? Because I was kind of waiting for another oh. slide. Oh. I've, have you seen those maps of the undersea fiber optic cables? No. Oh, they're really cool. I'll, t I'll find one and tweet it out later. But um, yeah, they're amazing just to see how many there are going across the sea. Sorry? Which geography publishes those? Tanner. Tanner. Okay. I'll find a map. I'll find a link to the map afterwards to, um, yeah, work that out. But it's really cool to see how many there are. That's the, that's the public ones and not the secret ones that the government doesn't want you to know about. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I think we're out of time and there's afternoon tea and so we should race and get scones and cupcakes before everyone else gets them. <laughs>